Am I ready to go, Allison? Yes, now you are. Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Um, as Father Sabo said at uh, St. Peter's, the pastor in South Beloit, even the sign of the cross is a prayer. Almighty God, we thank you as, and address you and love you as Father um, and Son and Holy Spirit. Uh, we love you as Son incarnate to the womb of the Blessed Virgin, who came and lived our life and suffered our sufferings and died our death in all ways but sin and offered to the Father a perfect, unblemished sacrifice, like the Lamb in the Old Testament that was slain uh, in, in the book of Exodus to lead them from slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea into the Promised Land, which for us, through the Holy Eucharist, signifies life everlasting in heaven, paradise, the new, uh, the new Jerusalem. So we ask you to be with us, comfort us. Uh, there are so many hurting, uh, depressed, starving, uh, emotionally deprived, materially deprived people. We ask, we ask Almighty God, we lift them all up to you and for all your private and special intentions as we pray together for the intercession of the Blessed Virgin on this feast of St. Simon and St. Jude. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Simon and St. Jude, pray for us. St. Thomas, pray for us. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, since the last time we met, when I, and I don't know when that was, our last book club, um, Joellen came to the offices about a week ago on the, whatever day, Father, the day after Father Bachlin spoke, and she was so excited, like she saw a ghost, or won the lottery, or the day her, her husband first proposed to her. Father Bachlin had, like, I guess, three to four times as many people. I'm losing it. I felt my, I was just like, and she went on, how great it was. And so I went and watched the video. He did a very nice job. If you have not seen the video, it, you can, it can be accessed by this through the St. Thomas website. He gave a talk on humor. And of all the things he said, what I was convicted about was uh, I need to walk around with, with, with a really much more joyful act. I know I'm joyful. I mean, those of you know me, but you don't know me in my private moments. You don't know me in all my other moments. I can be, we can be, in the light of politics, social evils, are, 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 at some of us who feel our patriotism is being challenged, our nation is clearly being divided, but we can still walk this earth and maintain a very strongly positive, upbeat attitude. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And he, and he concluded his talk by saying, we know how it ends. I'm very sorry to convict everyone here present. I'll start with myself. I live in my own drama. I created it. I'm the director. I'm the star. I'm the co-star. I'm the playwright. I'm the camera guy. I'm the stagehand. I'm the roadie. I'm even the groupie. And I'm the viewer. And I watch. And that's, that, that's all of us. So, so if you can, if you have a chance, uh, go watch his talk. And he gave, he gave a very, ni very nice talk. But here's the difference now. It, right now, it is uh, 7.10. This is my phone and my, my clock. I'm done at 8.10. I'm walking out of this place at 8.10. He spoke for an hour and 25 minutes. Imagine the nerve of this priest. An hour and 25 minutes. So I'm going to do it in one hour. And we're going uh, to start with a small joke, which is extraordinarily appropriate for this setting. He told some very good jokes. There's a man deserted on an island for 20 years and he finally gets rescued and the captain who rescues him says to, to the man uh, you're the only one on the, on the island he goes I'm the only one on the island he goes are you sure you're the only one on the island he says captain I've been here for 20 years I've searched every nook and cranny there's nobody else on this island just me the captain says well can you explain why there are three huts on top of the hill Three, three abodes, three houses. He says, as a matter of fact, I can. The first, first abode is my house. It's where I live. It's the house of, of where, I, where I sleep. He goes, what's the second house? He goes, well, that's where I worship. 
So that's the house of worship. I worship God there. He goes, what's the third house? Answer, that's where I used to worship. <laughs> we, we, we couldn't stay together. We couldn't stay together. Of all the ways a non-Catholic Christian finds his way back to the Catholic Church, there are three vehicles. There's more than three, I'm sure. There's three I stress. And they're also called the transcend uh, tr uh, transcendentals. The goodness, the beauty, and the truth. All of us, God has put into our world goodness, beauty, and truth as vestiges, as footprints, as icons of his living reality. One of them is, is goodness. We know uh, your, your joy, your, 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 your attitude, your, your service to the poor. It's attractive. People are attracted by your empathy. People are attracted when you pay attention to them. People are attracted when you, you, uh, you, you help with the, food, with, with the food truck, with the food pantry. People are, people are attracted when they found out you signed up to go down the Haiti mission. Goodness is very attracting. Number two, beauty. We have a lot of people who, I do not know why they oppose one to the other, but I enjoy sunrises too. I enjoy sunsets too. There are a lot of non-church-going people who are in the presence of beauty who say, wow, that's, that's, that's significant. That's special. Yeah, it is. And it's, and it's good for us. We've got both. We've got public worship and we can recognize the beautiful, beautiful in nature. Google this. Google Maps is an extraordinary device. Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. It's one of the wonders of the world. It's, it's just beautiful. It's gorgeous. And it gives you a sense that there's a higher power, that there's something else going on. Uh, people who, who go through the, the, what's the telescope? I'm going to say microscope. So beauty is another vehicle for um, believing in and helping someone come to the awareness there's a higher power, there's a God, there's a living presence that governs the universe. The th third way, which we have been baptized, most of us, I suspect, were baptized into, grew into, um, woke up without even thinking about it one day. As Michael Schmidt said, my, Father Michael Schmitz once said to the, to the, the uh, born-again Christian, I was born again February 26, 1978. What happened to you? He goes, I got converted the old-fashioned way. I was raised in a Catholic family. <laughs> we were just raised that way. But the third vehicle is the truth. And the truth is very simple. To me it is, anyway. I'm Polish. It's real simple. To the non-Catholic Christians to the non-Catholic Christians, for sure. Good people, for sure. Be seekers of beauty, for sure. People in the truth, for sure. But the simple question I ask those same people is, did he start a church? Or didn't he? Well, he did, but, but, but what? Did he start a church? And if he did start a church, there would be visible signs that would accompany the validation and, uh, and, and authenticity of his church there would be some living signs that would validate that what Christ left us still remains today and is living and is breathing. Um, the movement, what would Jesus do? WWJD. What would Jesus do? Ask the church. What would the church do? What, what, are, what does the bishop say? What are the bishops saying? Uh, we, we do have a living presence of Christ among us in the teaching magisterium. And they are for us an ongoing voice today to deal with the situations regarding uh, uh, modernity and, and whatever, whatever was to arise uh, uh, regarding society and culture and morality. Uh, jump way ahead in the reading. Uh, the Didache. Remember the story about the monk who's going through, going through uh, 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 the cellar looking for certain books and he finds the Didache, which is the Greek word for teaching. And what's fascinating, they, they want to, would anyone want to know what, when did they date the book? When did they date the Didache? Around when? 100. Right around 100 somewhere. Is that right? Yeah, 100. 100. So for, for, this is for the Catholic, of course, but I also have on the, on, 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 on over here the non-Catholic Christian. So the Christian who has not accepted the Eucharist. The Christian who has not accepted the Pope is the figurehead and chief shepherd of the Christian community. In the year 100, 
if John the Evangelist died in the 90s, ten, a decade after John the Evangelist died, there is a living text, a remnant of writings that was the recorded and we have possession of that said two things. It got into the particulars of worship, which is very curious to me. I'll tell, I'll tell you why in a second. It got into the particulars of what Catholics do on Sundays, the, the Lord's Day. And St. Paul mentions it. Why we go to Mass on Sunday? It's the Lord's Day. It's the first day of the week. The Didache spells out the word teaching in Greek, spells out what Catholics do in the particular regarding worship. And number two, how we live socially. The choice of two paths. And what does it bring up that's a fascinating to me, to you? What does a Didache bring up that sh will shock people? Abortifacients. This is 2000, this is 1900 years ago. The Romans and the Greeks already had a method in place. A certain concocted uh, a plant chemical mixture to produce uh, a miscarriage or an abortion. Fasc it's fasc that's fascinating to me. Where, where, does, where, where does the Bible spell out uh, 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 abortion? We say not to have an abortion. We say the Ten Commandments. The church already in the year 100 is dealing with abortifacients. Basically, whether or not the egg was, was fertilized, whether or not, uh, uh, actually, we don't say fertilized egg. You know that? Small tangent. You know why? There's actually no such thing as a fertilized egg. Seriously. We've said it before. We've said it before. It's a living, it's a living being. <laughs> it's an embryo. It can be an embryo. It can be a blastocyst. It can be a baby. But we know it's human life, right? right? I've used this for like 15 years of my priesthood until someone said, hey, Father, there's no such thing as a fertilized egg. I know what you mean, but a much more correct understanding is a living being. Okay, but isn't that fascinating? In the year 100. Now, uh, uh, since I went there, I'll finish this point. In the year 100, in the Didache, they're spelling out what Christian worship looks like because they assumed the apostles and their immediate successors and, and, and from the year 33 to 90, I mean, you have, obviously, Matthew, Mark, and Luke talking about uh, he took bread in his hands, blessed it, broke it, gave it, uh, uh, imitating the feeding miracles, imitating the Passover of Moses. But they assumed, because of Acts 2.4.2 and Acts 2.4.6, that all Christians knew about the breaking of the bread. And in Luke 24, the road to Emmaus, the early Christian community assumed it. You say, well, give me an example of that. I'll give you an example of that. If I ask you out for dinner, I'm not gonna tell you on the way to dinner, oh, by the way, they're gonna offer us a salad course and the possibility of soup. We're gonna assume it. Now, unless you're, unless you're visiting and you're from another planet, or, or, or seriously, or from a different culture. Maybe, maybe you're from Ethiopia. And I mean this not sarcastically, seriously. Or maybe you came from you know, the desert or prison. Or, but most of us already know that a meal is begun with a soup or a salad. You say, that's stupid. That's, that's, they assumed it. They assumed it. And that's another reason why the Eucharist uh, reality, the Eucharistic reality, is not in the creed. The early Christian writers, the early church fathers could not have foreseen every problem some fallaway Christian was going to raise and raise their hand up against our living teaching authority. So, that's, I just threw that out. Let's go backwards. And we've got to move fast. You're all paying attention. Fantastic. How long did that take? The clock's over here. That took 10 minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Seven, so 720. I have six nephews, six, six, three nephews, three nieces. They never met my dad. My dad smoked himself to death. He had four bypasses. He could not do the rehab. And he died 59 years of age, 58, 59. And they never got to meet my dad. Too bad. They have my last name. They are blood relatives of mine. They never met my dad. There's a whole level of being a coat neck. They don't know about. Yes. Now, when I say something at mass and you smile and my mom goes, oh no, 
because she knows my dad. <laughs> She's actually married to my dad. My father makes being a coatnik a lot more intimate and brings a lot more understanding to the traits of our family identity. This is a metaphor. To understand those men and women who came directly after Christ give us a fuller color, a fuller visual, a fuller written record of what it was like to live in the time of and the immediate time preceding the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. Look, I think there's an assumption by non-Catholic Christians and maybe some Catholics. I think it, I, I'm just drawing this out and, and maybe it's ridiculous on my part. But I think there's an assumption that the, uh, people who want to bang, we say this as a pejorative, the fact that Catholics don't read the Bible enough, I don't want to use it as a pejorative. I wish there were more Bible-banging Catholics. We have less Bible-banging Catholics. They used to be a pejorative. He's a Bible-banging Protestant. We need more Bible-banging Christians. By that I mean people immersed in the scriptures, people more ready to invest their intellect in meditating, studying, and being aware of what, 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 what Christ said and did as he left, as he left, left this for us. Um, where was I going with that? I went off on a tangent. Anybody connect me? Uh, Dad, the Kotniks, the, the, the knowing Jesus to his followers, the Bible. Oh, they have to assume it's in the Bible. Well, there was there was there was a whole period of time there was no Bible. They assume. Thank you, Whew, boy. <laughs> that was a strong cappuccino. <laughs> They assume that he ascends into heaven. You've heard this before, I'm sure. I'm not the first one to tell you this. The assumption there, therefore goes, he ascended into heaven. Peter turns around and goes, oh my goodness, it's the Bible. Genesis to Revelation, it's all here. Yay! The Bible was brought about through labor pains. Yes. The Bible, and some, some strict conservative Catholics don't want to hear this. The Bible is brought about through a lot of editions and edits and different copies and discussions and discernments. What goes in? What goes out? How did Genesis make the cut? Why didn't the, why didn't the Gospel of Mary Magdalene make it in? Why didn't the Gospel of James make it in? Why didn't the Gospel of St. Thomas make it in? I know the answer to that, actually. But I don't want to tell you because it'll throw you off. Seriously, I know, I know exactly why the Gospel of St. Thomas did not get in. But how do those, how do those books get in? Origin, the book you were taught, told to read said, the, the book says, Origin has one of the living, existing copies of the original books of the New Testament. And now most Catholics don't know this. I didn't know this until seminary. The New Testament, the Old Testament gets codified at the Council of Jamnia by the Jews. They throw out the Greek books in 70 AD. Once the temple falls, the Jews have a big meeting in this town called Jamnia. The, 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 the rabbis and the scholars and the scribes, and they basically get the Jewish canon down. They say, these are the books that we're going to follow, the Jewish people. And the Catholics take those books, but we add the seven other books that were written in Greek. Because the assumption is, what, God only can speak Hebrew? <laughs> and to all my Latin Mass people, do you think if Latin Mass is the only way to say Mass, and we want to follow Christ, why don't we say the Mass in Aramaic? Yes. That's right. <laughs> anyway, that's a, we'll go, that's a whole other whole story to get into. Okay, that, that, I didn't mean any political implications by those statements, but I'm sure we could take some from them. Um, the point is that the church came first. The church labored and gave birth by the gift of the Holy Spirit to the Bible as we know it. And in any discussion with anybody on matters of faith or morals, when it comes to the question of authority, do you believe the church came first? Yes. And that's a big question. If it's solo scriptura, which is not in the Bible, I'm going to have a hard time discussing with you why we believe the things that we believe. That we do say are in the Bible, but may be in the Bible organically or be in the Bible by inference. I'll give you an example. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, state, Mary was immaculately conceived. You will not find that in the Bible. You will not find that in the Bible. 
You will find the angel Gabriel saying, Hail Mary, full of grace. But there is no sentence that says, At the time of Mary's conception, the Holy Spirit appeared and withheld from her the sin of Adam and Eve. That is not in the Bible. And I've caught myself in this, so I'm, I'm just letting you know. And this is not embarrassing at all. Uh, Harvest Bible Church, I'm, we're having this argument. It's not in the Bible. I'm, I gave a few arguments. I found that without accepting from another part, church authority, and the church came first, I was holding a losing hand mm -hmm. with them. I was, hold, I was holding a losing hand. I believe Mary was immaculately conceived because the church told me to believe that logically, if she had the sin of Adam, which remember, they quote, they quote St. Paul. St. Paul says, uh, all have sinned and fallen short from the grace of God. They point to that passage. Well, Mary's, Mary's one of them. They're right. They are right. Technically, they are right. Technically. But we are right because we have a higher authority than just the words of Scripture themselves. But the people who wrote the Scriptures and have the authentic authority in how to interpret them. And what we find, here's, here's the point, here's our segue. We find that early on in the church history, early on, church fathers were ascribing to, to, to Mary her blessed virginity and immaculate conception. Do you know, I, I know a guy, well, it doesn't matter. Well, it's, his name is, it doesn't matter, I shouldn't use his name. This is on tape. But I, you know guys with funny names who got nicknames. And they get nicknames for a reason. I know a guy, we know, you, you and I know a guy named Mike. I call him the mayor. Because he, he, he acts like he's the boss. And, and he, he takes it. He, he knows I'm being sarcastic. I go, that's Mike, it's the mayor. And, and, he, and, he, and he puts up with it. Uh, Mary's nickname was the Blessed Virgin Mary. <laughs> that was her nickname. I mean, think about that. I mean, we take, we take it for granted. But that's what they called her. Her perpetual virginity was assumed. This is, this is part of a body of teachings found within the context of the early church fathers. Uh, let me go way farther back. Uh, if my nephews and nieces don't know my dad, they don't know the fullness. If the Protestants don't meditate the blessed, if Catholics don't meditate the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary, her role in nurture, her role in, in, in pre, their prenatal role, can you imagine, as, especially as a woman, of course, especially as a woman, carrying around for nine months, and uh, this is, correct me if I got the wrong terminology, is gestating a, a term? Yes. Gestating the Son of God? Now, here's where I got the non-Catholic Christians. Well, she had other children. Why well, do you know that? Well, because it says Jesus had other brothers. I, oh, I know it says that. But it never said she had other children. Don't forget that one. It does say he, have, he has brothers. I can say this man, my brother. This man's becoming my brother. This man's my brother. That's my brother. That's totally my brother over there. We go way back. And you know what I mean when I say that? We don't have any blood between us. Although we do have the blood of Christ. Which, not as a tangent, but as a significant point, may make us more than brothers. Yes. How about that one? Seriously. So, uh, yes, you, you got something to say? Yeah, if we say to a Protestant, if I point out Matthew, upon this uh, rock, I'll build my church, and the Protestant comes back with, uh, well, he meant the mystical body. Do you have it? Great question, great question. So, so they, they, they have a couple answers for that. And, 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 and Peter, right? Yeah. Great question. Establishing authority is always going to be in any discussion central to the final explanation. If in today's World Series, which I'm going to go home and watch, <laughs> if a guy hits a foul ball that is clearly foul, not closely foul, like in the stands, and the runner keeps going around the bases, and the umpires let him, the game's over. No one's going to watch. There's no authority. The rules have just been broken. Now, I know a, a close call. They may have to bring the video camera in and do a replay thing. But if, if, if the young players just go, look, man, from now on, if you hit the ball in the stands, it's okay. 
Baseball would fail to be no baseball. There, there has to be an arbiter. There has to be a final authority. There's a king of the jungle. There's a head of the household, the wife. There is someone. There, there is. Hey, don't, don't kid yourself. In this parish, Father Simon may roar. I may do a lot of yelling. No one here who's the parishioner kids about who's the boss in this parish. We know who's the boss. The Don, Monsignor Hermes. Right? No, seriously. And funny little joke. It's tangent. We'll get, I'll get back to you, but we got time. I got I to do some time here. Uh, I'm jealous of Father Bachlin's success, so I have to be more entertaining. Uh, uh, the state's attorney and his wife are very good parishioners of ours. Very good person. He's a lector, and she's in the rose. You know, just says the rosary all the time, and she's in different different sodalities. So, in his illness, you know, he had back surgery. They wrote him a card, and he showed it to me. And she said on the card, you know, get well soon. Our, our prayers are for you. May the Blessed Virgin heal you, and may you soon be walking and get better. And the state's attorney wrote, "I have the most respect for you. You are an incredible, incredible pastor. How in the world did you put Father Jerome in charge?" <laughs> But just an example. So, Peter is mentioned more than any other person in the New Testament next to Jesus Christ. Peter was, as we, I mean, we can go through all the stories, Peter, and I'll, Peter, <laughs> I find that hysterical. His name's Peter. There's no one else, hey, remember, his name was Simon. Today's the feast of Simon. Interesting. I mentioned it, and this is totally tangential. I mean, I'm going tangential tangentialissimo right now. There's two Judases. I asked a question at Mass today. Why? I don't have an answer. But there's like a thousand guys out of the thousand disciples. He calls 12. He's clearly delineating and demonstrating leadership among the, among the followers. You're all followers, but you're all not apostles. There's 12 guys that are apostles. I'm naming 12 men. No disrespect to the women. I hope, hope, hope that ship has sailed. Because I know in the 80s that the, the, the ship was in port. No. Oh. <laughs> And then I want to get a bunch of guys together and get placards. We can't get pregnant. We can't get pregnant. In other words, let's just accept how God made anatomy and who he, who he, he designed to lead the church. P men are not priests because they're better or the more powerful uh, of genders. I think it's actually it's probably the opposite. As, as Father Bachlin said, quoting Father Bachlin now, what does God spend most of his time laughing about? Us. Okay? So... Uh, Simon was named Petras, which is rock. Go 2,000 years ago and get a, be an engineer trying to build something with these sand metaphors. What do you build something on? Greek word is Petras, on the rock. Because the winds will blow, the storm will come, it will buffet the house. And boy, as Catholics, has our, has our house been buffeted? And I ain't talking about Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> Took you that long? Um, and we stood, we stood still. We stood, so, so I'm just going to go with that. I'm going to go with uh, uh, the, the, the keys. I am so fortunate. We were very generous. Uh, I paid for the car, but he's, he's been in a parishioner forever. This is, this, is, this is the key to the parish center, and this is a keyless entry car. This is my, this is my world right here. Pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. Again, I have no authority, obviously, in this parish. <laughs> but keep it simple. Keep, keep it simple. Thank, seriously, keep, this, this is my world. You're probably jealous. Now I have keys in the car from my mom's apartment, her condo. They're in the glove compartment. I shouldn't tell you that, but they're in the glove compartment. <laughs> but this is what I live with. When Jesus says to Peter, "These are the keys." Everybody at the, there would, there would be no dispute, there would be no second guessing, there would be no questioning, there would be no assuming, there would be no misunderstanding. There would be no, 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 none of that. If we were bystanders and we saw Jesus say to Peter, and thou art Peter now, Abraham, Abram's name became Abraham, the father of all nations. Saul became Paul the greatest of all evangelists. Simon became Peter, the chief shepherd representing Christ. And he was given the keys to what? A Buick? <laughs> the, is that a Buick? Yes. No, no. Just kidding. It's a joke. It's a stupid commercial. <laughs> he, he got the keys to the kingdom. Look like a Buick. 
to, it doesn't look like a Buick, to bind and to loosen. This is pretty, again, put yourself in the context. We got to go back into the context. If you meditate those scriptures, you will find conclusively this does not suggest, this does not infer, this does not kind of indicate. This is as black and white, as significant of, uh, not a symbol, but of a conferral of authority as you can get. And by the loosen what? The gates of heaven. So again, Peter, it is an excellent question because at the end of the day, uh, I, 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 want, I want to do this and I am doing this. I'm doing this and I want to model it. I want to argue less with non-Catholic Christians. I want to agree with them more on things I can agree with them more. On Catholics, I'm very sorry. Many, many, most Catholics don't go to church, as you know. Most Catholics do not go to church. When I do funerals and weddings, and I don't, I don't mean this to be a tangent, I, Father Simon does it, I know Monsignor does the same thing I do. At funerals and weddings, when fallaway Catholics make their way back to the Catholic Church, we tell them, please, at communion time, come up with your arms crossed if you're not a practicing Catholic, 95, 98, 99%, they still receive Holy Communion. Uh, they receive communion. Outside, the, outside these doors, they do whatever they want. They come inside the church, whether they're not listening, whether they don't want to be told what to do, whether they don't clearly respect authority, they come up and receive Holy Communion. So my point is, kind of like a doctor in triage in determining how to, how to bring medicine to the sick and to the ailing. I'm not saying change the truth. I'm not saying compromise. I'm just saying for me, for at least, for at least one, for this one Christian, I'm going to stop being so argumentative because I haven't gotten a lot of good results out of it. Do you accept Jesus started the church before the scriptures were written? No, I do not. Well, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about, the, how about you know what? Let's talk about the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. We can generally agree upon those. With most non-Catholic Christians, we can agree. Visit the sick, visit the prisoner, bury the dead, instruct the ignorant, what happened to be, which would happen to be the person you're talking to. <laughs> That was funny, actually. Um, but I'm serious. Know the limitations of what you can talk about if they don't accept the premises that we've accepted as givens. And the first one we accept as a given is Jesus started a church. And he had a succession from Peter all the way down. Who's Peter's successor from Antioch? Ignatius. That, as a student of history, back to my nephews and nieces not meeting my father, we met in word, in letters he has written, the successor of St. Peter. That's invaluable. Did you hear what he said? I'll tell you what he said. He told the people, because they, 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 they walked him. Antioch used to be in Syria. It's now in Turkey. It's, I, I've been there. I'm proud to say I've been there. It's a part of Turkey where they're more darkly complected. They got bigger beards. Uh, when, they, when it's called a prayer, some show up. In Istanbul, which we, we spend some time in, when it's called to prayer, the Muslim call to prayer, and I know this is on video, I'm an eyewitness of this, not many people show up. That was my experience. But in Antioch, where it's a little more, they're a little more serious, more people show up to their mosque when they have the call to prayer. They're a little more serious. We didn't look for alcohol. There was none to be found in Antioch, which is now Turkey. They are serious observance of the Islamic religion. And St. Peter's uh, church is, is there. It's barely noticeable. It's in a cave. And of course, what do you think you'll find in, at St. Peter's church? An altar. <laughs> and, we, and we have letters from the successor. The successor was taken by Romans from Antioch and walked to what port? Smyrna. 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 And then Troy. Was it Troy? Troy. He got on a boat in Troy, so they walked him. So he, he, got, he got friendly with the guards, the successor of St. Peter. After the, after the Jews persecuted the apostles in Jerusalem, they fed to Ant they fled, excuse me, they fed. They, they, ate, they ate too. They fled and fed. In Antioch, the successor of St. Peter in Antioch is Ignatius. Ignatius gets busted by the Romans. They're going to take him by foot. He gets to know the Roman guards guarding his body. He gets a pen and paper and sends letters ahead telling the churches, hey, I'm coming through. You can find those same churches in the book of Revelation, by the way. Interesting.
That whole area of Turkey used to be all Catholic. It's all Catholic churches. So he's writing, hey guys, don't get me out of this. And if I have a weak moment, don't, don't, don't be soft on me. I'm going to my death. And he says this, which I found profound. It needs to be read again and again and again. I'm going to be eaten by lions, and I want my bones to be ground down like the wheat that makes the flour that becomes the Holy Eucharist. That's written in 107. That is highly significant. Within his letters, as he's writing them to the churches, getting to Troy, getting to, to be, to be uh, thrown into the lions, he, na he, he lays out for us the hierarchy of the church. Listen to your bishops. Presbyters, be submissive to the episcopos. Priests, listen to your bishops. Deacons, serve the widows. Serve a table. <coughs> serve. And take the duties by which you've been commissioned with seriously. Um, so, hey, a little pause. We were doing good. This is, this is highly significant to connect these dots. Um, I, I wanted to go back even further. Let's go back even f as, far, as far back as I can go. As, as, as far back as I can go. I would not know, according to the Jewish religion, the, the Islam comes much later. Uh, what, 622, I want to say. 6, yeah, 612, 612. Uh, Muhammad hits the scene. So all we really know about God besides uh, polytheism, um, new age, whatever, we really learn from the Jews. And the Jews who believed in the one God, they were the first monotheists, told us about God. So when Jesus comes up, Jesus shows up and says, hey, by the way, he's like a father. It threw a lot of people off. Good observing Jews were thrown off by that familiar and, and, and uh, what's the word for family? Fam, fam. Familial. What's, what's the word? Familial. 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 It's a big word. Sounds Italian. Sounds familiar. The familiar. The familial. Like familiar. But the significance of that closeness that God as the ultimate higher power being, obviously who he's later going to say he is, equal to in power, majesty, and glory. The, say the word again. Familiar. The familiar. No. Familiar. The familial. The, the familiar. Fam familiar. No. Familial. 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 Okay, 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 okay. Enough. Enough critics. Familial. <laughs> it's shocking that without Jesus telling us, we would not know this information. Obviously. It sounds obvious, but we would not know this. We would not know how close God is to us unless Jesus told us. If we stayed Jews, we would not know this information. Jesus reveals it to us. And he tells us this. And in the context of telling, uh, telling us this... This is all before the Bible. Excuse me? This is all before the Bible. This is all before the Bible. But I find this fascinating. Because Jesus reveals this to us, now we know this. He carries on with a group, a band of followers, this unity, uh, this organization, this commissioning that sends them to the four corners to pronounce... pronounce that God is to us like a father. It's radical. It's revolutionary. It's life-changing. And it continues to be for us a moment of excitement. And I don't want to jump to one, one major conclusion, but it should be in our DNA. It should be in our marrow. When we pray, when we study, when we eat, when we sleep, at whatever we do, to be thinking about how can I make my next conversation with whoever I'm going to be speaking with on an encounter with them and for myself with God. How can I be a better evangelist? How can I introduce to the people I am talking with, working with, living alongside this encounter with a God that's so close to us? That is my mission in life. That's what they were able to pull off in a unitive manner. In a manner that if there is ever a dispute or a difference of opinion, we have a judge and a supreme arbiter to determine for our group what is of the right opinion and what, excuse me, not opinion, what is the truth of the matter and what is not. And that is to be valued. And that is awesome. And as, as, as uh, Cardinal uh, Dolan said when the Pope showed up in, in New York, 
uh, at Madison Square Garden. He says, he said, uh, your, your Holiness, we pray for you every single day at Mass. Every single day at Mass, we are reminded in our worship, in the breaking of the bread, that we are members not just of a local parish, not just members of the Rockford Diocese, not just members of the Universal Church living, but members living and breathing of a communion of saints that goes back all the way to the earliest followers and to Jesus himself. And when you receive communion, you are in that full communion, that historical two millennial procession of Christians through Jesus to the Father. That's absolutely profound. Now, there's a couple ways, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't mind looking at a note, but I'm thinking out loud, there's a, uh, oh, uh, how about the, uh, what, what book talked about in your reading, the specific regulations for our CIA? If you were coming into the church back in the old days, there was 40 days of fasting. Where was that found? Did the Didache, or was that the, uh, did anyone remember? <laughs> Scott, do you know where that's at? Nobody remembers. No one read it. That's okay. I still love you. <laughs> it might be the Didache. It gave a tur the Turk instructions. Okay, so here's, here's my point. The early church had a system, had regulations about how a non-Christian would come into the church. Fasting, purification. They would, they would hang out with you. There'd be, there'd be a sponsorship program. There would be meetings. There would be formation. There would be, not necessarily, obviously, the Bible study, but texts of the Bible. Certainly, uh, uh, Philippians may have been, may, may, may have been around. Uh, God did not, Jesus not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself and took the form of a slave. That was early. The kerygma, he came, he died, he rose. This would have been part of their formation process. So now, 2,000 years later, we run into the, to the Willow Creeker and says, you Catholics. What's what what's what what's what's what this Lent stuff? It's not in the Bible. And then we don't know how to respond when we should say, no, it's not. It's part of the first century's regulations of how to get a non-Christian into the church. We look like we're hanging on to sort of arbitrary traditions and sort of uh, archaic shell of rituals that are rooted in the earliest of Christian communities. People died over that stuff. And 2,000 years later, from a lens of Jesus, 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 I love Jesus. Can I have more? Is there more with Jesus? Now, this is, this, this is not a tangent, and I don't want to go into it too much, of, too much of a detail. This is my opinion, and I'm curious for your thought. At a later class, unless you, unless you have a brilliant idea right now, at a later class. I have the conviction, the same way you like hearing your own name. If you are, uh, let me see, I can pick on Mike. If Mike's in traffic court, let's say, and he's trying to hide, and someone, hey, Mike! Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, um, even, in a, in, even in a more serious way. If you're a Christian non-Catholic, or a Christian Catholic, and you say the word Jesus, and you mean it, because I'm not disputing, I will never deny that the people in South Barrington are not Christians. I've never said that. I'm not saying that. These are morally based, good Christian people. And they're not just there. They're, I know the congregational. I gotta give you a quick story. I gotta get back to the point before I lose it though. Uh, the, 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 that's how brain, my, weak my brain is. I was gonna go off on... We're in traffic court. Oh, your name, your name. The, 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 the physiological effects of knowing the name of Jesus. Okay, get me back to that point. The physiological effects of knowing the person of Jesus. That's actually the point. I was at my Italian restaurant about two weeks ago. This man came in. I started talking to him. He, uh, I was just like this, just like this. And uh, the talk soon became an interrogation. He cooperated. And he wound up going to the congregational church. Three children. He described his kids, one who liked church, one of the boys who went to see the girls at church. I found that interesting. He's being honest. His wife is Catholic. She don't go to church. He was such a good Christian. Probably the first time in a long time. And I'm not getting soft. I will not take that as a criticism. I did not badger this man. 
or proselytize him. First time in my life. He was such a nice man. I was taken back by his, how nice he was. He was clearly living the Christian faith. I wasn't going to confuse him over, over a meatball and a, you know, a little a, a green pepper and salad. He's struggling with, with a, I shouldn't say this out loud, but whether he, I, don't, I don't know what kind of marriage he has. His wife doesn't want to go to church. He goes to a congregational church. He's got three kids. Clearly a Christian. God bless him. So I just want, just for the record, to make it publicly known, I'm not disputing the genuine nature of their intentions or, or where they are with the Lord. I will say this, though. When these same people say the word Jesus Christ and mean it, I'm telling you, there's a, for us as well, there's a physiological response in the brain, like or the release of dopamine. And you get excited. Did you ever notice that when you talk about Jesus? Hey, I don't want to mention that. I'm not going to mention their names. There's a couple in our parish. Get them talking about the good old U.S. of A. See their blood pressure get up. <laughs> Let me tell you another thing about the president. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know people like this. It doesn't matter who the president is. The Democrats would push, the Republicans with Obama. But it's just human nature. You, know, you people shed so much blood over religion. I'm never defending the shedding of blood over religion. What are you going to shed your blood over? Your family, your good name, your property, defense of your religion. I'm serious. Defense of your religion, your wife, your family's life, right? So when you talk about things you love, you get really excited. So it is, I am of the opinion that a lot of these community Christian places, I'm not going to call them churches on purpose because the Pope says they're not, they're groups of community, good Christians. They get so excited. When they meet me, the name of Jesus, they're convinced. It's enough. I don't need the church fathers. I don't need to know about Polycarp. I don't need to know about Irenaeus. I don't need to know about the Gnostic heresy. Or the Ebonites. Or the Marcians. Or the Manichaeans. Or the Albigensians, or the, or the uh, uh, what was 325s, uh, uh, and Nicaea, the uh, uh, Arians. I don't even know about you. Who are the Arians? We're going to do this next class. Next class, this is the foretaste. We're going to talk about the totally unappreciated Christian, Catholic, Christian church councils that expelled all the threats to the purity of the name of Jesus Christ and the purity of our association as members of his one true body and the reality that there's only one faith and one church, as St. Paul says. There's very, what gets my blood going? And I stopped, I'm getting better. <laughs> I'm serious, I'm getting a little better. I'll give you, I'll give you a direct example and, 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 I'll, tell you how, and I'll tell you what, what happened, I'll tell you how I'm getting better. His name is Marcus. Again, I, I, I'm conscious we're on camera. He's a very nice man. He's a willow creaker. And it, some don't like the word willow creaker. Some take it. So if they don't, if they don't like it, I say that I won't use it. Some take it. They, 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 I, I've, I've said this too. If I took two people who attend the Willow Creek Assembly, and like my dad was a, a detective, so he interrogated people for a living. I was like his lead uh, victim of being interrogated. <laughs> Actually, the interrogation didn't last very long. What'd you do? Oh, I'm scared. I did it, I did it, I did it. But if I took two well-trained South Barrington Christians who attend Willow Creek into a room separately, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, after enough interrogation, I'd come out with a couple different answers on significant teachings. If you people, if you use people were sufficiently trained in matters of faith and knew the catechism, you'd come out of that same room and not have the same answers. I'd have the same answers you would provide the same eyewitness testimony because we kept the same story. Mm -hmm. That's why we're Catholic Christians. Okay? Uh, the universality, the consistency, the catechism. Oh, Marcus. So, I'm at Willow Creek for the Global Leadership Summit. This was recently. I keep bringing this up because it was awesome. It had nothing to do with religion. It had to do with these lead, big shot leadership speakers. Women and men, a lot of women, from the University of uh, Chicago Booth School, Graduate School of Business, Harvard, 
uh, Pixar, the Pixar co-founder, and they were giving us this. I, I, had, I, got a lot of, I got a lot of great ideas from that association. But every time they used the word church, it was used so often, my brain wanted to explode. So at one point, I'm, I'm just like this, and I purposely wanted to be known. So, I'm running late. I'm, we've got to move quickly. I purposely wanted to be known, so I got a name tag. So I wrote on a name tag. It was almost, I'm exaggerating. It was about this big. Father Jerome Catholic Priest. What a cross. <laughs> nice to this. They took pictures of me. I, mean, I was like a movie star. They took the, the Willow Creekers took pictures. I'm sure it's in their archives somewhere, yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure the little caption would read, even priests come here, you know, yeah. how they market stuff. So um, it happened to be on feast days of major saints. It was actually right around the Transfiguration, which turns out to be 40 days before the feast of the exaltation of the cross. August 6th is 40 days before the exaltation of the cross. Why did Jesus transfigure himself on Mount Tabor before Peter, James, and John. According to the church fathers, to prepare them for what was about to happen. Gave them a foretaste of the heavens so they can endure the pain and the agony of the torture and the tragedy of his death. That's highly significant. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there with this on my mind, and they just kept using the word church. My brain wanted to explode. I'm like, no, no, stop, stop. It's not true. You people are awesome, but it's not true. So I'm walking with my big badge on. Some young girl, 24, jumps, literally. There's a crowd of like six. Catholic priest. And she grabs me. And she, she looks at me. She goes, does your brain want to explode? <laughs> I'm like, yes. Yes. She's like, Whew. thank you, thank you. I, she goes, church. I go, I know. <laughs> now, not to get, that was, that's funny. you. Not to get controversial, but just, 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 and just, just totally extemporaneous. I, just, I, I didn't plan this metaphor. Uh, we love everybody. If two men or two women want to call themselves married, as an, as an American, I'm a Christian, but as an American, I'm like, no, yeah, no, I, I respect you both. I think you should not be discriminated against. But to me, marriage is something different than what you two are now, your cohabitation plan. I'm not trying to make the, the exact metaphor. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Jesus said, men, love your wives the way I love the church. What church was he talking about? Who was that church? Yep. Us. We were that church. And it looks like something. So when you use the word marriage, it means to every natural law follower and reasonable, objective believer, of Christ anyway, God intended man for woman for the procreation of the species and the mutual satisfaction of the couples. That's, that's why we have marriage, as a basic cell of, of, of society. Church is that institution, that organic living organism of, of followers of Christ united in him as, as the head and we as the members of the body. You can't just use that word indiscriminately. And that's what we're doing. So, this guy Marcus, who's a great Willow Creeker, and I don't think, I think he's one of those guys who doesn't mind the word Willow Creeker. He goes every Sunday. And keep in mind, folks, I don't know who you talk to or, or, or how much of this you do. I do this all the time. I literally every single day. And when I look at the world and watch some of the TV, if you're a Christian, hey, good for you. That's awesome. You sure wish everybody was Catholic. We're, we're, going, we're, going, we're going to Haiti in two weeks. We have class next Wednesday. To no class. So we'll, hopefully God willing, the plane will land in Haiti. And I'll come back for the, the week after. So there's class on Wednesday. No class. To the following class. The guy in Haiti who runs the school, Deacon Patrick Moynihan, it's so simple, it's so obvious, but he says it all the time. He asks people, would the world be a better place if we were all Catholic? The answer is yes! Stop thinking about it! <laughs> The answer is yes. Would the world be a better place for all Christians? Yes. What about diversity? Trust me, there'd be tons of diversity. Look at our parish. Look at Father Simon. <laughs> There's tons of diversity. I don't need to be a Methodist to be diverse. Catholics are very diverse. I gave this homily on Sunday between Father Simon, myself, and, and Monsignor Hermes. Father Simon does this. Remember, remember anyone at my mass? Yeah. Father Simon does this. 
I do this. Ah, you whiners. You don't love Jesus. You cry too much. And you got Monsignor Hermes. I love everybody. <laughs> if I was a parishioner of this parish, I'd be schizophrenic. <laughs> Who do I listen to? <laughs> One I can't understand. One is yelling at me, and the other guy says he loves me. <laughs> we got tons of diversity. And by the way, what's the opposite of diversity? <laughs> University. University. <laughs> Thank you. What's, what's better than diversity? Unity. Uh. Huh? Huh? Am I on a roll or what? Huh? Okay. So, Marcus and I are having this conversation. And it, it goes like this. I said, we've got to honor the saints. And they don't have that concept. So this movie comes out. Uh, War Room. Anybody see it? Yes. It's a good movie. It was great. Very Protestant. It is so Protestant. Father, how Protestant is it? At the end of the movie, the, uh, when you saw uh, Pay It Forward, yeah. calling on angels, got a really cute moment, you get, you get crying, <laughs> you get goose pimples. I like, hey, I don't care what Father Simon says, I like movies like that. <laughs> They're okay, you cry, you know, calling on angels. Well, at the end of, the, uh, end of uh, War Room, they have this Christian moment from people all over the world. They wouldn't show one Catholic thing. <laughs> It wouldn't show a priest, wouldn't show a nun, wouldn't show an altar rail, a tabernacle, a priest collar, a statue of Mary. Come on, give us a break. Throw in a statue of St. Joseph or something. <laughs> they clearly had to make the ending totally Protestant. Anyway, here's the point. I said, Marcus, do you see the movie? Yeah. Did you notice the scene where the little girl, if you didn't see, I'm not reading the movie for you. The little girl, no, the mother's having marriage trouble. She goes to see a spiritual director, a sponsor, someone who knows the faith better. Okay, a spiritual director. And they, she basically gets a war room, a place, she, a place she sets aside for prayer and gets her favorite scripture passages. And she puts them on the wall and she meditates them and prays. We would do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, the daughter, this is not planned, happens to go, and she used to keep her shoes in there. They're kind of an affluent family. So she kicks out all the shoes out of this room and makes it her war room, makes it her, her place of prayer with all these gospel verses written down. So the daughter discovers the room, and she discovers her mother's writings. She thinks about her mother's thoughts, and she meditates what her mother's all about. And, it, and they all go, wasn't that awesome? And I thought, push pause, let every Protestant see the movie, and get, okay, wasn't that awesome? That was awesome. <laughs> That's the lives of the saints. <laughs> it's exactly what that is. We are walking into the war rooms of the church fathers and mothers and desert fathers and desert mothers and abbots and abbesses and nuns and monks and priests and lay people and popes and councils. That's what that is. So they have, I don't know how the baby will do this. But there are, there are Christians who walk this earth that if it smells like a Catholic, if it looks like a Catholic, it cannot be somehow added to our dimension of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ. You would think that the Trinity is Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm serious. And if you saw the movie and you could just pause it because they're following it perfectly. It's a Protestant movie. And go, okay, do you see that? That's why I read Sister Faustina. That's why I read St. Francis de Sales. That's why I read St. John of the Cross. Because they dealt with similar problems, like this woman with, with a struggling marriage. They, in their own individual ways, with their own individual crosses, bore them in angelic and saintly ways and give us a pathway. Two more examples, and I'll leave you alone, so I know we're running late. Jesus died at 33, right? He never saw 34, he never saw 35, he never saw 36. John Paul II died at what? Was he 85? How old was John Paul II? Anyone know? Yeah, 85. 85? I think it was 85. The point is, what would Jesus look like if he was 85? I think John Paul II. Seriously, what's your point? My point is, can't we learn from others? ways to get closer to God. Can't we have mentors that are not in the Bible, that are either near us or in history, that can be pointers and helps to a deeper understanding of who Jesus 
is. I tell women all the time, don't marry that guy if he treats his mother like you know what. If we have Catholics, my brother and sister are Catholics, if you have a, lessened, a lesser devotion to the Blessed Virgin, there's some aspect of your understanding of Christ that I'm going to say is diminished. In knowing Mary, through the rosary, the litany, and just, just Hail Marys, in front of one of those statues, that we worship Mary at. <laughs> no. That reminds us of the woman who brought into this world by her yes, salvation for all of us. Two, th and two thoughts, and I'll leave you, I will leave you alone. In general, the Christian Protestant reads the Bible and asks himself with great sincerity and true faith, not the fullness of faith, but true faith, how can I be saved? The Catholic should read the Bible and ask himself, how can we all be saved? And wouldn't the same moral code and worship apply to the lot of us? And I think that's fascinating. I'm going to close with this. The Second Vatican Council, which took place between 1962 and 1965, called Catholics the world over to what's called a giornamento. It's, a la it's an Italian phrase, which means a renewal. Part of the renewal the Second Vatican Council called us to and towards was something called resourcement. Going back to the, the original sources. The first one, which we are in complete agreement with them, is the Bible. Yes. Read your Bible. Do not be outmanned or outwomaned. Don't, I don't want to hear a story from you getting back to me. To, yeah, I ran into one of your buddies at the Starbucks. He didn't know that Ch John had more chapters than six. Or didn't know what was in Matthew 18. Or Matthew 25. You don't have to know all the verses. Come on, I don't know them either. I know those. <laughs> but I'm just saying, go back to the scriptures. And the, and the Second Vatican Council says, go back to the fathers. Go back to those early century teachers who lead us in a linear continuity right back to Christ. Mm -hmm. To think you're reading something written 1900 years ago that lines up exactly, God willing, I wake up breathing, and I have every intention to. Okay? But I don't promise anything. God has his own will, and God knows all these things. And offer Mass at 6.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, if you're there. We will be participating in the same breaking of bread, the same turning of bread into the body of Christ. Christ did himself on their way to Emmaus in Luke 24. That they did in Acts 2.42 and Acts 2.46. I find that entirely fascinating. So, um, thank you for your attendance. I wanted to get you out of here before Father Bachlin did. And we'll meet next Wednesday on time. You have a question? Read chapters 12 to 19. Read chapters 12 to 19. That, that, is, that is Scott Tenney, who provides these notes. These are good notes to have on hand. Read them. And if at any time during the week, and I'm very sincere about this, ready? Because you're in the elite group, obviously. You took the time to come out here tonight. I, I sincerely appreciate it. You got these notes? You got a question? Call me. Uh, Allison, Allison, you can turn it off by now. We're done. And thank you, Jesus.